Good morning and welcome. It's nice to see everybody this morning. <laughs> so as we begin, a couple of notices. Um, I've been talking about my How to Eat Bread course, which is happening this coming Wednesday. So it's a book called How to Eat Bread, and we're looking at some of the chapters, and it's exploring how to read the Bible, and it's an opportunity for us to discuss different ways of reading the Bible and different things that we might find within the book. So that begins this Wednesday and it's going to be in church now. Um, We'll open the doors at about 7.15 and we're aiming to start at 7.30. So please do join us if you'd like to. Even if you haven't thought about it so far, you can still come along if you'd like to. Uh, Next Saturday, that's the 9th of October, there is a conference run by York Diocese and it's online it's called Saying Yes to Life, and it's, um, it's about green issues, and there are is some workshops in it, and you can choose different elements to join in with. Um, so if you'd like to know some more about that, I think there's a poster at the back, um, but it's Saturday, and it begins at 9.45, and it goes on until about half past three, um, but I think you can dip in and out of it. So if you would like to know more, um, you could come and ask me, or I think there's a poster at the back. On Wednesday the 13th, we've got a charity bag collection from the vicarage from Martin's house. So if you've got any, it's clothes and textiles of different kinds, um, but not quilts, I think, or cushions, because they can't pass them on in any way. Um, if you've got anything like that, bring them in any, any bag at all to Martin's house, and what they do is they weigh it, and it uh, gives us a little bit of money towards church funds. So it's been taken on Wednesday the 13th, but you can take it to the vicarage from tomorrow if you'd like to. And then a final little notice from me. Um, In November, I'm going to be running a sort of baby baptism preparation course, which is happening on a Wednesday morning. I'll be talking about that in a bit more detail in a couple of weeks. But I would really like it if we've got any knitters, if they might knit us a shepherd and some sheep for one of our stories. So if you feel that you're able to knit a shepherd or some sheep, please do come and let me know and we'll have a chat about it. Um, The sheep can be sort of any size, any shape, as long as they look like sheep, and as long as they are um, appropriate for babies, and nothing too tiny that they're going to put in the mouth. But uh, yeah, if you could do that, please do let me know. That would be really helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's everything, so let's begin our worship with a moment of quiet. Our first hymn is hymn number 41, and we'll omit verse 2.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Please sit to pray. <coughs> God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father, Father of our, our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall do, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And so we receive God's forgiveness into each of our lives today. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you are able to stand, please do. Glory, Glory to, God to God in the, in the highest and, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so as we stand, let us pray. And in our collect prayer today, we just pray that God will kindle faith in each of us to help us going through good times as well as in bad times. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking that which lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Janet will now come to do the reading. Our first reading is taken from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air 
and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every, every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his wife and his mother, and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Our next hymn is number 132 and we'll omit verse 3. the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you. Some Pharisees came and to test Jesus they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, 
Let the little children come unto me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands upon them, and blessed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So in today's Gospel passage, Jesus is talking about divorce. And despite the fact that divorce is now relatively common in society, we need to be sensitive in our discussion of it because it's still a very emotive subject and people will have had different experiences. And I'm aware that even in this building, there will be people who have experienced divorce from different positions. Maybe they've been through it, maybe family has, maybe they know friends who have. And so this morning, it's absolutely not my intention to upset anyone or to make them feel uncomfortable. And so I ask in advance for your tolerance of my articulation, which may not always be as clear as I'd like it to be. But I hope that by the end of this talk that we have reflected together and that you found it uplifting. So divorce. It's pretty clear what Jesus thinks about it isn't it? He's definitely against it and there's certainly been a long tradition within the church of disapproving of divorce and refusing to solemnise subsequent marriages until as recent as 2002. And that's really ironic considering the formation of the Church of England was formed against the background of Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. Divorce has been happening for a long time, as that shows. Henry VIII was the 1500s. But in our passage today, Jesus refers back to Moses' time and the divorce laws then. So we're talking a history of thousands of years of marriage and divorce. And it's not going away anytime soon. So it's helpful that we have some teaching from Jesus and that we as Christians look into what he's saying to understand marriage and divorce better within a life of discipleship. And sadly, Christian and church attitudes to divorce have had a really painful impact on many people, turning them away from faith. And so I think it's really important that we look closely at the text and then we get our facts and our message to others straight. So I'm going to pick out a few key points from this passage. The first thing to note is that it isn't Jesus who brings up the subject of divorce. So Jesus isn't going around picking fault with people saying, oh, you're divorced. I don't like that. Here's why. Instead, what's happening is that he's teaching a crowd of people, talking about other things. Maybe he's telling them about loving your enemies. And the Pharisees show up and they start to heckle. So this conversation about divorce is brought up by them as a way to test Jesus because they know it's a tricky subject. The Pharisees are trying to catch Jesus out in the same way that they do when they ask him about money. They present him with a a question about taxes and they say, should we pay tax to Rome? And he gets the coin and he says, whose head's on it? If it belongs to Caesar, you pay it to Caesar. And so Jesus does a similar thing here. He refers them back to Moses because they're Pharisees so they would know about the Mosaic law. And he asked them to think about the rules that were put in place to facilitate divorce. Now let me be very clear from the outset. Divorce is not sinful. It was permitted in Jewish law as the Pharisees say in the passage. It was not and is not a sin to go through the process of divorce. But permitting it does not equal promoting it. 
divorce is not the best case scenario, but it is something that may need to happen in certain circumstances. And Jesus, in his answer, doesn't approve divorce, but he does try to explain some more about it. So the next thing to notice is what Jesus does. He explains that God intended marriage to be a certain way. And he goes back even further than Moses to Genesis, which was our first reading today. And what Jesus is doing is showing how marriage was intended to be. So in the very beginning, in the first place, marriage was intended to be a loving partnership so close that it was as if they were one being and not two. Humans, men and women, were to leave their parents to form a new union with the help of God. And as one being, you wouldn't knowingly do something to hurt yourself, and so the impression goes on that you wouldn't hurt the other person in the marriage with you. You wouldn't act in a way that causes pain to your partner. So this was the ideal, this was the model to aim for. And Jesus reminds the Pharisees and the crowd of that. But the divorce law from Moses had to be written because not everyone could keep that standard. Jesus uses the phrase, because of your hardness of heart. Human beings are imperfect. We act in sinful ways of all kinds at all sorts of times towards each other. And we don't always treat others lovingly and with respect. And so the laws are written to provide clarity and to guide And that's true of all the laws, the divorce laws within them. And in Jewish society, so Moses' time right up to Jesus' time, it was the case that a man could divorce a woman, but not the other way round. If a woman received a divorce certificate, what it actually did for her was free her, because it proved that she was divorced and she could marry again, and then would not be left destitute. So, In saying those hard words, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and if his wife does similarly, she commits adultery, Jesus is showing that either party can fall short in marriage because they don't uphold that perfection of love that God intended, but that divorce is a measure provided for when things go irretrievably wrong to help safeguard the two parties. So Jesus doesn't approve of divorce in the sense that it would be better not to need it, but he understands the reality of it. So here's the next important thing to remember. Jesus loves each individual and he wants them to flourish. His words about adultery show that he does not take it lightly when a person putting their own needs first causes pain to someone else. The ideal is not achieved, the promise is broken. But that isn't seen as an abstract moral. It's about the fact that it hurts someone else, and it hurts God. If your spouse prefers another man or woman, or wants to lead their own life without you, you've been let down, you are suffering, and that is not okay by Jesus. But, I think, Neither does he want people to remain in a marriage that causes pain. Relationships that cause poor mental health or where domestic abuse is present are very far also from God's intention for marriage. They are not the loving, mutually preferring, equal union described by the phrase one flesh. Jesus brings life in all its fullness. And he stands against oppression of any kind. So I think that there are circumstances in which divorce may be the healthiest option and of which Jesus does not disapprove. Another key point. Jesus does not condemn. A really significant event, not mentioned here but mentioned in John's Gospel, shows his refusal to condemn a woman caught in adultery. If we set aside for a moment all the fascinating commentary about the positions of men and women, who was accused and who wasn't, we look at the context. Again, it's another example of the Pharisees 
bringing a case before him to see what Jesus will say. They drag this woman in front of him and accuse her of adultery and ask him what he's going to do about it. The laws of Moses say that she should be stoned for adultery. And so Jesus can either agree with that, in which case he's not being consistent with his other teachings, or he can object, in which case he's criticising the Jewish laws, which are the very things that he claims to serve. But Jesus turns the matter on its head instead by asking those who have not sinned to cast the first stone. And as everyone melts away, he says, Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I. From now on, do not sin. Jesus doesn't condone what she has done, but he doesn't judge her either. He invites her to make a change and choose to leave her sin behind in the same way he has invited all his followers to repent and live the kingdom way. In our lives, we make all kinds of promises. We have all sorts of good intentions, which we break frequently. We all sin in various ways, and Jesus calls us all to repentance. That's exactly the point of the story, that all were sinners before God. So going back to today's gospel passage, after Jesus' strong words about divorce, Mark moves on a little bit awkwardly into an altercation over children. As I touched on two weeks ago, children in Bible times were seen as having very little importance or value, and the disciples, perhaps mindful of Jesus' busy schedule, maybe thought it was a waste of his valuable time to see babies who wouldn't even remember him. But to Jesus, the last become the first. The children are important to him, and he enjoys them as they are. He picks them up in his arms, and he blesses them. And they are an example of God's love, and the way that God welcomes all his children of whatever age. Jesus becomes angry because no one should be excluded from him. The disciples don't have the right to decide who is in and who is out. And this is, I think, the connection back to divorce. Jesus says to the parents of the children, let them come to me and do not stop them. Christians have been far too keen for far too long in creating boundaries about who can and can't have access to God. We have all sinned. There is no hierarchy of sin. In God's eyes, no sin is worse than another, and it all separates us from him. But the good news is that Jesus died to bear the penalty of all our sins so that we can be forgiven, and so that we can be welcomed into his presence. And so Christians need to be pointing the way to Jesus, ushering people into his presence, not barring the door. It is not our place to judge. We do not need to defend Jesus from the sinners because in fact he's busy looking out for them to show them his love. So as I draw to a close, let me remind you of those important points and let us challenge our perception about divorce. So firstly, Jesus is not out to get divorcees. He didn't choose this topic, but he is giving a genuine response to a problem that was put to him as a test. Secondly, he explains how God intended that marriage should be before acknowledging that humans don't always get things right and so divorce is a necessary reality. Thirdly, the emotional pain of marriage breakup goes against Jesus' desire for flourishing. But he loves rather than condemns. And he calls all of us to repentance and forgiveness. And so fourthly, divorce is not a barrier to discipleship or church belonging. It is not shameful or sinful, but it is painful. So rather than being the people like the disciples who turn others away from Jesus, let us instead show the compassion and love of Jesus in our lives for all of those 
too needy and let us welcome them into his presence. Amen. Please stand to affirm what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, through God and through God, begotten of the of one who is with the Father, through him all things. to pray. Good and gracious God, your love is never failing. Your heart is open to us. Your presence never leaves us. Strengthen our faith and deepen our love for you and keep us in your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Father, bless this church that it may reveal your love. Let it be open and an accepting church. Let it be a forgiving and sensitive church. Let us be a loving and understanding church, that your church may reflect your love for the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, comfort all who are having any difficulties in their relationships. We pray for all who find it hard to make friends, for all who have been betrayed or deserted by loved ones. Remember all who have to face violence in their homes or at work. We pray for all who cannot trust the people around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in our dealings with each other, teach us to listen Teach us to forgive, teach us to understand, and teach us to love. Give us the courage to start again. We pray for our friends and loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, give strength to all from broken homes. We pray for any where there is little love or understanding for all families that are needing help and attention. We pray for all who are separated from loved ones through sickness. And at this time, we pray for Gilbert Steer, who is still in hospital, and any others known only to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Praise to you, Lord, for in Christ Jesus so many are brought into love and glory. We give thanks for your saints dwelling in everlasting light, and we pray for loved ones departed, thinking especially of Frank Fletcher, whose funeral is this coming Thursday. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. If you come, please stand. I think that perhaps in a world that has so many trials and um, real difficulties in it, the one thing that we must celebrate is the peace of Christ. And this is a wonderful thing that we can share today, to know the peace of Christ in each of our lives. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And so at a distance we offer each other a sign of peace. I've just come back from the land of my fathers and I was looking, looking over the Lacha estuary uh, last week to uh, the, the bottom end of Llanelli and it's a gorgeous place. You can see the seabirds and the wind was blowing and the sea was uh, blue and the sky was blue and I was reminded that there was a little village just off Lacha uh, where the Welsh revival started and the next hymn, it, which, uh, which Catherine chose, not me, is um, the one that built up the, the Welsh revival. It talks about God's love. So I'll hand over to Doc to announce it. <laughs> Our next hymn is hymn number 987. So we turn in the order of service to page 12 and as we come together as God's people we give thanks for this bread and for this wine. Blessed are you Lord God of all creation through your goodness we have this bread to set before you which earth has given and human hands have made it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor and the majesty for everything on earth and heaven are yours. All things come from you and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. 
you raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, ever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. For in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to... And get, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross, and proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. As we look for his coming in glory, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect sacrifice. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. So let us now sit to pray. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, give us your peace. So draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast. For here we receive you. Here the memory of your passion is renewed. Here our minds are filled with grace. And here a pledge of future glory is given when we shall feast at the table where you reign with you and all the saints forever and ever. Amen. We say the after communion prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God, who is almighty, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 379. There is tea and coffee in the hall.